Chair recognizes Representative Fialba. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. We were often called upon to debate and wrestle with the weighty matters of our time and important issues facing our great state, and this session is no different. We have contemplated and largely agreed upon a new path for education for our children. We've confronted and tackled the thorny complexity of water, planning, and finance, and we have addressed a myriad of topics that are both controversial and divisive. But in each case, members, we have done so with the respect of the ideas of our colleagues and with an understanding that all of our intentions are honorable, even though we may not agree with the positions taken by the other side. But today, member, and recently, I feel that we have crossed the threshold of appropriate discourse and have torn asunder the bonds of comity that have held this session together. Recently, it's been said in this chamber and in the chamber in the Senate by certain members of this body that certain members of this body are conducting a war on women, or we are intellectually dishonest, or we are unconstitutional, or are acting unconstitutionally, or we are politically motivated, or that we are following the leader of someone who does not agree with us, uh, with the view that we are looking towards the primaries instead of what is best for all Texans. Well, let me proclaim for all who will hear me today, there is no monopoly on righteous indignation, and mere disagreement does not justify the hostile attacks of the honorable intentions of the members of this body. I'm a son to a mother, a husband to a wife, a father of two daughters and a son to come, and was a brother to a sister. I was raised with and by strong Texas women. I take leadership from the brilliant and able leaders, female leaders, in this building, and I respect and I shall support with every fiber in my being the rights of every woman in this state and this country. I stand with Texas women, but I shall stand here no longer and be accused of conducting a war on women or that my intentions are not wholly honorable merely because I choose to, to protect and support human life. We fight this fight because of innocent human life. There have been, been great discussions today about why. Why would we do this? Why are we conducting this legislation in this way? What is this process? And there have been a number of props that have been shown. We've seen hangers. We've seen needles. We've seen knitting needles. We've seen turpentine. Well, I have a prop for people here. This, ladies and gentlemen, is my 13-week-old son growing in my wife today. This is a baby. This is a human being. This is the reason that I care so much about this. My little son is a gift from the Almighty. He has fingers and he has toes. He can sit crisscross applesauce. He can stretch his arms out and his legs and turn his head towards me when I tap on his mother's belly. And I know this because I spent time with him last Monday in the doctor's office with my wife and my two daughters. So regardless of what this debate may, where this debate may go, please understand that our intentions are honorable because we care for and we fight for human baby lives. When you ask about inconvenience of driving a thousand miles, when you worry about a $20 ticket, when you talk about the issues that arise, we do so because we are protecting human baby lives. That is what this argument is about. That is why the people care so much. That is why our intentions are honorable. And that is why we have these discussions today. We've had a great discussion today about fetal pain. Well, regardless of the answer to that great debate, there is one thing that is certain today. And that is that my son and every 20-week-old gestational baby share a common element with every person in this room, every member in this room, and every person that is with us today. And that is, they share the common element of humanity. This is not a clump of undifferentiated cells. This is my baby. And I will fight, and I will fight, and I will fight to protect my baby. And that's why this matters. I support 
HB2. And I will continue to fight for this cause because it matters. And it matters not because, again, my intentions are not dishonorable. It matters for my son. It matters for other babies, other humans in our state who will have to deal with these questions. I recognize what this means. I know these decisions are tough. But we do this because we believe in the protection of human life and we believe in protecting babies. Join me today in protecting human life, human babies, my son, all 20 month old, they are 20 week old babies and support HB2. Thank you members. Chair, Chair recognizes Representative Turner of Carrot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. I speak uh, as we close on this bill in opposition to House Bill 2. And as I begin my remarks, I'd like to ask us, how did we get here? How did we get here in the middle of July when we were all supposed to be gone at the end of May debating this bill, which is actually a series of bills rolled into one. And the answer is, these, this bill, these proposals were not ones that just ran out of time in the regular session, like we could argue that the criminal justice issue did or transportation did. These weren't bills that died on procedural points of order or grounds. They were bills that failed to make it through the process for one simple reason, because they're bad policy. They're bad policy. There was a reason they died in the regular session, and they should have been left dead at the end of that session. And I want to say very clearly, on behalf of myself and the other members who oppose this bill, there's not a single one of us that likes abortion or wants there to be abortions. I wish there was no abortion. I wish we lived in a world in which women were never raped. I wish we lived in a world in which a woman or a young girl was never a victim of incest. I wish we lived in that world, and I hope someday we will. But right now, sadly, we don't. And and I think all of us know that's not the world we live in, and that's why I can't understand when Representative Thompson proposes an amendment to exempt victims of rape and incest from some provisions of this bill, that this body won't support that. But none of us like abortion. We all want to reduce abortion. How do we do that? How do we really do that in a way that's honest? in a way that's meaningful and in a way that would be effective. We don't do it through this bill, because this bill won't accomplish that. We reduce abortions by reducing unintended pregnancies. How do we reduce unintended pregnancies? What about passing policies that would reduce the number of unintended pregnancies amongst teenagers, where Texas, sadly, is one of the leading states in the nation? or reduce the number of repeat teen pregnancies, of which Texas has the highest rate in the nation? How about implementing effective, age-appropriate, proven, evidence-based sex education in our public schools, which some of us try to do uh, today on the floor, try to do in the last uh, special session and in the regular session, but has been consistently rejected by this legislature, to actually give young people a chance to make informed decisions about their health while still emphasizing the value of abstinence. What about fully funding and restoring the women's health program with this legislature cut two years ago? A proven strategy to pre prevent unintended pregnancies, thereby naturally reducing the rate of abortions and certainly reducing the cost to taxpayers who would have paid for Medicaid birth. What about Medicaid expansion? that Texas, which has the most to gain of any state in the nation, with since we lead the nation in the rate of uninsured, with nearly six million of our residents without health insurance, we could insure at least one and a half million Texans just like that by passing Medicaid expansion, half of whom are women. And women 
with access to a primary care physician and regular health care would be able to, to receive the health care they need to be able to control their reproductive decisions and make plans about when they will get pregnant. And so those are the things we could do if we were serious, some of the things we could do if we were serious about truly reducing unintended pregnancy. But we don't do those things. Instead, we have House Bill 2. And so let's talk about House Bill 2 and how this myth that this bill is about women's health and about women's safety. House Bill 2 is intentionally designed to limit access to abortion, which is a safe and legal procedure protected under the U.S. Constitution. House Bill 2 will do very little to prevent abortions, but it will do a lot to prevent safe and legal abortions, as Ms. Thompson talked about extensively earlier. And the truth is, well, we all know that this bill is about shutting down clinics. And you don't have to take my word for it, and I won't say his name, but there was a member on this floor earlier who bragged that I can't wait for two weeks from now when this bill makes it to the governor's desk and we can finally stop saying this is about women's health and talk about what it is, which is shutting down abortion clinics. I can't wait to go back to my constituents and be able to say that. And I know that a lot of members will be able to say that. And I think when we look at what's happened over the last two weeks, if anything good has come out of the last two weeks, it is the incredible outpouring of, of emotion and passion and interest from the public that this legislation has caused I, on both sides of the issue. And I'm very grateful for all of the people who are here today in the gallery regardless if you support the bill or oppose the bill. But for the thousands of people who came, who flooded the Capitol the night the Senate debated this bill, the thousands of people who were here last week, these aren't political activists. They're not on some email list. They got, they got fired up because what they saw was an injustice, an injustice being done that infringes on women's constitutional rights by government run amok. And that's why we have at a state affairs hearing last week more than 3,000 people come out to testify. Very few were actually allowed to testify. Some 1,100 in support of the bill. This is the list. It's about 29 pages and the witnesses against more than 2,000 about three times as many pages. And so, if anything good has come out of this, it is the increased participation in our democracy, which I hope will continue on this issue and other issues going forward. But let's not say this bill is about women's health. Let's not say it's about women's safety. And let's not say it's about anything other than what it is, which is shutting down access to safe and legal abortions, which as of today are still protected under the United States Constitution. Chair recognizes Representative Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. Most of you know me as the uh, uh, discusser of Purple Thursdays. And, you know, the reason that we did that, even though it was funny at times, was that I truly believe that when we work together as Democrats and Republicans, that we get more done. And we get done things positive for Texas. I also fully realize, however, there are issues that, whether we're Democrat or Republican, we may not can agree on. And this is one of those issues. You know, in my first tenure here at the House, one of the things that I did is I went around to virtually every one of you and met with you in your office. And I did that because I wanted to know you as people. And I wanted you to know me as people so that when I heard you up here debating, maybe on an issue that I strongly disagreed with, I would remember our visit and I would know that while Representative Farrar and I disagree on this issue strongly, I remember her talking about her life and, and our visit together. And so that allowed me to understand that she's a person just like me. She believes what she believes that might be different from me. 
but I should respect that, and I do. I also respect those people, though, that are on this issue with me, and that they're just as passionate as the other side might be on this issue. And I know them, I know their hearts, and their hearts are just as pure as the hearts that are on the different side of this issue. What I believe we ought to do in this house is we ought to respect the process and the people. And we do a good job of that most of the time. There's probably a couple percent of the time that we don't do that. We witness a little bit of that today. But that's what we do, because that's what the people in the gallery deserve. That's even what those unborn children deserve. And I know this is an important issue, and I'm going to close my short talk with a poem. This is a poem that my sister-in-law wrote years after she had an abortion. She was a young mother, had just had a baby just uh, less than two years old, unmarried, had gotten pregnant again. The father had pressured her into, you have to have an abortion. Her mom, uh, my, wife's, uh, my wife's mom, my mother-in-law, had just recently passed away. Things were chaotic in that family beyond belief. And so, without being so embarrassed, not knowing who to even turn to, she agreed to have that abortion. Years later, she wrote this poem called, In My Heart, and I want to read it to you. In my heart there lives a child, one who's never breathed. I never knew the pain I'd feel for the child I'd never see. I imagine his face, or his eyes brown or blue, his hair shining like the sun, and his heart shining too. He never got the chance to know what, it, what life would have in store, because I chose to end his life before he was ever born. Something that seemed so easy will haunt me every day, for the child I gave life and quickly took away. The Lord in His mercy forgave me for being weak. He now holds my child and promises someday we'll meet. I long for His promise of that place will never part, but for now I'll cherish this child that I've only known in my heart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.